Police emergency operator Bonnell. My, I just got a call from my dad, and his cousin came over his house. He borrowed a shovel and a gas tank with a girl in the car, and she was tied up. And the girl got out of the car, and my dad's cousin went and put her back in the car. What's the cousin's name? Mikey King. Michael King. And what does he look like? I know he has dark hair. He's white, kind of chubby. What's the cousin driving? A green Camaro. The 911 calls you just heard are related to the shocking kidnapping of mother of two, Denise Amber Lee. She was abducted from her home in broad daylight and was blindfolded and restrained in the back seat of her captor's car. While in a struggle with her attacker, she somehow managed to covertly get hold of his phone, and in a desperate attempt to save her life, she secretly dialed 911, hoping to relay enough information so that they could send help. There would be many more 911 calls relating to Denise's disappearance in the hours that followed, but unfortunately, due to a number of errors and mishaps, none of them would be able to save her life, and what would follow was a harrowing sequence of events that would ultimately end in tragedy. This is the heartbreaking true crime story of Denise Amber Lee. Denise Amber Lee was heading toward the prime of her life. As a mother to two precious boys, both under the age of two, She relished in the joy of nurturing them. Despite her young age of 21, motherhood came to her with an innate sense of ease and dedication, and right from the start she put them first in everything she did, offering up her social life to ensure that she never missed a precious moment and that she was always present to support and care for them. Beyond her maternal duties, Denise was happily married to her soulmate Nathan Lee, whom she first met during her final year of high school. Together they shared countless moments of love, laughter, and resilience, navigating through life's highs and lows hand in hand. Despite their tender years, they embodied a maturity and depth of commitment that many twice their age could only dream of. By 2008, Nathan and Denise had been married for three years already and had jumped headfirst into adulthood. Having started a family so soon out of high school, they weren't exactly financially stable, and the reality of providing for two little ones on a tight budget was no easy feat. Denise was a stay-at-home mother who took care of her family, while Nathan worked three jobs just to make ends meet. His main job was as a meter reader for the Florida Power and Light Company, while he also picked up shifts stocking shelves at a local supermarket and spent his summer weekends umpiring Little League games just to have some extra cash in his pocket. The pressure of being the sole breadwinner weighed heavily on Nathan, but he was determined to give his family the best life he could. And although times were tough and they literally lived paycheck to paycheck, the Lees found solace in the simple pleasures of life. For Denise, nothing was more important than the love of her family, and she cherished every moment spent with them. Materialistic possessions held no appeal for her, as she found greater value in the sentimental treasures that adorned her life. Perhaps the most precious of all was the $40 ring that Nathan gave her on their first Valentine's Day together. While some may have long forgotten such a small token, Denise wore it every day, a constant reminder of the love that bound them together. The ring spoke volumes about their relationship representing the unwavering commitment and unbreakable bond that existed between them. For the Lees' happiness was not measured in dollars and cents, but in the richness of their relationships and the depth of their love. And even in the face of financial struggles, they remained steadfast in their devotion to each other. In January 2008, right around the time of the fateful event, Denise and Nathan were hustling hard to save up for their first house while renting a cozy home in Northport, Florida. With its serene atmosphere and proximity to their families, it was the perfect spot to raise their kids in a relatively safe environment. They felt content in their cozy home and slept soundly at night, convinced that they were protected from harm. That was, of course, until that ominous day of January 17, 2008. The morning of January 17, 2008 was a peculiar day in Northport, Florida. The air was unusually warm, and the sun beat down on the streets with an almost ominous intensity. But for the Lee family, the day began like any other. Nathan dutifully left for work to start his shift at the Florida Power and Light Company, while Denise stayed back to tend to their sons. They exchanged their usual morning pleasantries, 
and Nathan promised to check in on her during his break. And true to his word, he called Denise shortly after 11 a.m., eager to hear about their day so far. Denise told him that she was cutting the boy's hair on the back porch, while Nathan listened intently, enjoying the sound of his family's voices. She also mentioned that she had turned off the A.C. to save on electricity, so Nathan advised her to open the windows and let in some fresh air, and Denise confirmed that she'd already done so. Everything seemed to go on as normal, so Nathan bid his wife goodbye and headed back to work, oblivious to the fateful events that would soon unfold. Nathan finished his shift at around 3 p.m., and on his way to the car, he tried to call his wife again to let her know that he was on his way. But strangely enough, she didn't answer. He tried calling her another eight times during his 25-minute drive home, and uncharacteristically, the phone just kept ringing. Although it was odd not to have a response from Denise, he didn't become concerned until he reached their house. As he pulled into the driveway of their house, he immediately noticed that the windows were all closed, contradicting Denise's earlier claim that she had opened them to combat the heat. But what was even more alarming was the fact that there was no sign of his wife. As he searched the house, his mind racing with all the possibilities of what could have happened, he made another odd discovery. His two sons were sleeping in the same crib together, something Denise never did. And to make matters worse, he also found Denise's phone, keys, and purse still inside the house. He instantly knew that something was seriously wrong, so he immediately called 911. Northport Emergency. Uh, yes, um, I'm at 7912 uh, Latour Avenue. Uh, mm -hmm. I just got home from work, and my wife, I can't find her. My kids were in the house, and I don't know where she is. I've looked every single place. After getting off the phone with the 911 operator, Nathan called his father-in-law, Rick Goff. Rick was a police sergeant with 25 years of experience at the Charlotte County Sheriff's Office. Aware of the common tendency for reports of missing spouses to be overlooked, he made it his mission to ensure that the matter received immediate attention. At 4 p.m., detectives arrived at the Lee's residence and found no signs of forced entry or a struggle, leaving them with nothing but a baffling mystery to solve. The house was a dead end, so police began knocking on neighbors' doors in search of clues, and it was then that they stumbled upon a promising lead. One neighbor said that she had seen something suspicious between 1.30 and 2 p.m., a dark green Chevy Camaro driving very slowly past her house, circling back and forth at least five times. The neighbor became suspicious and immediately went out into her front garden to see what the driver was up to. She made sure to make direct eye contact with the driver so that he knew that she was watching. But at that very moment, he pulled into Nathan and Denise's driveway. She assumed the driver was probably lost and that he finally found the house he was looking for, so she went back inside and continued watching TV. However, she couldn't shake the odd feeling she had about the car. So about ten minutes later, she stepped back outside and saw the car pulling away. Though she couldn't see who was inside, she had gotten a good look at the driver and the vehicle, allowing her to give the police a detailed description. With this new information, an alert was sent out to all nearby units to be on the lookout for a dark green Camaro, with a chubby Caucasian male with graying hair in his mid to late thirties. Despite their relentless efforts, they wouldn't make any progress in the case for the next two hours until 6.14, when they got another 911 call, this time from Denise herself. 911? Hello? What's the address? What's the address that you're at? What's your name? Denise displayed incredible courage and resourcefulness when she found herself in this harrowing situation. Despite being blindfolded and bound in the back seat of her captor's car, she was able to secretly obtain his cell phone and dial 911 without him noticing. In a remarkable display of composure, she spoke to the operator in a way that fooled her captor into thinking she was talking to him. She even cleverly convinced him to turn down the radio when the operator was having trouble hearing her. Down all the street you're on? No. Do you know where you're at? 
know this guy that's with you? Can you see or do you have a blindfold on? Can they turn off the radio or turn it down? Denise's remarkable composure and resourcefulness during the 911 call, despite being in an extremely distressing situation, is truly remarkable. She was able to provide vital information to the operator, including her full name and street address, while also conveying that she was being held against her will by someone she didn't know. Although she did everything she could to ensure her safe rescue, the unfortunate reality was that the phone her captor used was an older generation device without GPS capabilities, making it impossible for law enforcement to trace the call. They were, however, able to identify the man who had registered the number. Michael Lee King was a 36-year-old plumber who lived just a stone's throw away from Denise and Nathan's home in Northport. His life had recently taken a downward spiral with months of unemployment, bankruptcy, and a pending foreclosure on his home. He was also recently divorced and was left as the sole provider for his 12-year-old son. King had an extremely low IQ, estimated to be around 76, which placed him on the border of mental disability. The low IQ had been attributed to a traumatic sledding accident when he was just six years old that left him with severe frontal lobe damage. Despite his difficulties, he had led a seemingly normal life without any criminal history until now. During Denise's 911 call, her captor could be heard mentioning his cousin Harold. Well, just after her call was terminated at 6.23 p.m., the phone lines lit up once more, this time from Sabrina Muxlow, the 17-year-old daughter of Michael's cousin Harold. Police emergency operator Bono. My, I just got a call from my dad, and his cousin came over his house. He borrowed a shovel and a gas tank with a girl in the car, and she was tied up. And the girl got out of the car, and my dad's cousin went and put her back in the car. What's the cousin's name? Mikey King. Michael King. Sadly, at the time of Sabrina's call, Denise was a mere four miles away from her home. During the distressing phone call, Sabrina confirmed that Michael King was responsible for Denise's abduction. The events leading up to Sabrina's 911 call are harrowing. Michael arrived unexpectedly at his cousin Harold's home around 6 p.m., seeking assistance with his lawnmower, which had apparently become stuck in mud in his front yard. He asked to borrow a gas can, a flashlight, and a shovel. As Harold handed him the items, Denise suddenly leaped out of Michael's car and sprinted across the road, shouting for Harold to call the police. Michael chased after her, and after catching up to her, he forcefully pulled her back to his vehicle before shoving her into the back of his car. It was also during this altercation that Denise managed to take Michael's phone from him and how she ultimately managed to call 911. When Harold witnessed this particular scene, he immediately went to his cousin to ask what was going on, but Michael immediately dismissed his concerns and told him not to worry about it, before hastily speeding off. Harold's gut instinct told him that something wasn't right, but he tried to rationalize it as just another domestic dispute between Michael and a new girlfriend, given his cousin's tendency to engage in tumultuous relationships. But as the minutes passed and the more he thought about what he witnessed, the weight of the encounter continued to gnaw at him. He knew that he couldn't remain silent, and he needed to tell someone what he saw. But for some strange reason, Harold didn't call the police but instead confided in his 17-year-old daughter. Perhaps it was the fear of implicating himself, or the worry of being labeled a snitch, but either way, there was no doubt that his actions that day drastically reduced the chances of finding Denise before it was too late. At 6.30 p.m., just seven minutes after Sabrina Muxlow's call, another 911 call came in. The caller was a woman named Jane Kowalski who was traveling down Highway 41 near the Charlotte County line. While waiting at a stoplight, Jane heard what she believed was a child screaming in terror coming from the car next to her. Her heart raced as she looked over, only to lock eyes with the driver, a chubby white male with graying hair driving a Camaro. What sounded like a child screaming to Jane was actually Denise screaming for her life in hopes that someone would hear her. Well, I'm on 41 going south, and uh, I'm going to do a cross street right now. It's at, I'm on Chamberlain. I just crossed Chamberlain. I'm on 41 going south. And I was at a stoplight, 
And a man pulled up next to me, and there was a child screaming in the car. About a half the vehicle was he in? It's a blue Camaro, uh, like Camaro, like uh, in the 90s or early 2000s or something. Okay, it was a baby or? No, it was a child. It was That's more than a old. I, you know what? It's dark, and I and I turned to look at him, and he's a white male, sort of light colored hair, sort of plump. He's behind me now, and I tried to slow down so he could pass me, and I could read his license okay, plate. Ma'am, don't hang up, okay? I'm, I'm not. Okay. I believe he's still behind me. I'm at uh, Jinx Drive. I'm just crossing it. I'm going very slow, like 35 miles an hour on 41. And he's behind I, you. I believe he's behind me. He has not passed me, and he's going slower than I am, which is not right because we're, like, we're holding up traffic and stuff. But I think that he saw me look at him, and I'm not trying to be over dramatic here, but he's going even slower now. And is he pulling over? Oh, shit. And he's, tur- he's going to turn left on Toledo Blade. He's turning left right now. Oh, okay. And, it, it, it is, and I, I'm, I'm in the other lane, and Okay, now it's green, and they're in the arrow, green arrows, and he's going now. He's now, turning left on Toledo Blade. Yeah, do you want me to do you want me to turn? Try to follow him, or? Okay. Does he want her to follow him? Okay, can you turn? Oh, oh. He just turned on Toledo Blade. I don't know if I can catch up. There's a bunch of traffic, and I can't get over. Um, oh, boy. A child in the car, someplace between 5 and 10. And it was banging on the window. And screaming. And crying. And screaming. Oh, <laughs> like screaming, screaming, screaming. Okay. And not a happy scream, like, get me out of here, scream. Left on Toledo Blade. Okay, can, well, you can, lost him, and thank you now, and we really appreciate you calling us. Okay, can someone follow up with me? I mean, did, or, wait, what? hold on, ma'am. Okay. Having been near the Sarasota County line just moments ago, Jane thought her call went through to the Sarasota County Police Station, but she actually crossed the county line and her call was diverted to the Charlotte County Police Station, where Denise's father works. Jane did her best to stay with the driver and even tried to get the license plate off the vehicle, but Michael seemed to be on to her and would slow down whenever she did, making it difficult for her to have a good look at his plates. This is when Jane made her 911 call and when Michael made a sharp left on Toledo Blade, speeding off toward Interstate 75. Police finally had the information they needed as well as the location of the car, but this is where things would take a frustrating turn. Because Jane had crossed the county line, her call was diverted to the Charlotte County Police Station, while all the previous 911 calls related to Denise's abduction had been logged with the Sarasota Police Station. This wouldn't normally be an issue if the calls were logged correctly and nearby units were dispatched, But unfortunately, this never happened. As you could hear from the call, the office sounded pretty chaotic and the operator was writing down the information on a piece of paper and yelling it out to dispatchers in the office instead of capturing it on the system. Although the dispatcher acknowledged the information coming from the operator, it was never relayed to patrol units in the area. While the dispatchers later cited shift changes and understaffing as contributing factors to the failure, they were both suspended without pay in the aftermath. Despite the coordinated efforts of a search helicopter and multiple patrol units searching for Denise, the crucial information regarding Michael's car's whereabouts wasn't communicated to them. What's even worse is that it later emerged that a patrol officer was stationed at Toledo Blade at the time of the call, and Michael and Denise probably drove right past them. The following day, Jane Kowalski recognized Michael's photo on the news and immediately contacted the police to provide additional information. To her shock, She was informed that they had no idea who she was and that the information was never passed on to them. At 9.16 p.m., six hours after Denise was reported missing, a state trooper positioned on Toledo Blade spotted Michael King's green Camaro. Without hesitation, the trooper gave chase and eventually executed a skilled felony stop, blocking the suspect's car with his own. He immediately drew his weapon and ordered Michael to exit his vehicle. Despite being ordered to do so five times, Michael refused to comply. It wasn't until the officer threatened to use force that Michael eventually relented and surrendered. When police apprehended him, he was wet from the waist down and his shoes were caked in mud. The phone that Denise had used to call 911 was found in his pocket with the battery removed. Upon checking the vehicle, they found no sign of Denise, but a muddy shovel was lying on the back seat. 
They also found the SIM card of the phone and a gas can on the passenger side. Upon further investigation, Denise's palm print would later be found on the outside of the driver's window, and her blood on a blanket in the back. But this wasn't all they found. Hair strands torn out from the root were found tucked into the pocket behind the driver's seat, along with Denise's heart-shaped ring, the one Michael had given her on their first Valentine's Day. Denise had left her own evidence to ensure that Michael wouldn't escape justice. Despite the overwhelming evidence against him, Michael King refused to cooperate and maintained his innocence throughout, bizarrely claiming that he and Denise had consensual sex before they were ambushed by men in ski masks who kidnapped them. He claimed that he was a victim too, and even took credit for Denise's 911 call, claiming that he was the one who set it up. He told police that he somehow managed to escape, and the men drove away with Denise, and he didn't know where she was. One day later on January 18th, police found the naked body of Denise Amber Lee in a shallow grave, a short distance from Toledo Blade, the very same road where Jane had told the operator that the Camaro was driving the previous day. She suffered a single gunshot wound to the head, and it was evident that the gun had been placed directly against her temple. A short distance from her body, they found Denise's underwear, and after careful examination, they found it to contain traces of Michael's semen. Michael King eventually went on trial facing charges of first-degree murder, sexual battery, and kidnapping. He pled not guilty to all charges. Throughout the proceedings, his defense team attempted to paint a picture of a hard-working single father, with no prior criminal record or history of violence. They suggested that Michael had been pushed to the brink by mounting personal and financial hardships, ultimately causing him to snap. They also focused their strategy on Michael's childhood sledding accident, which had caused damage to his frontal lobe, arguing that this accident had caused significant behavioral issues for Michael and may have had a hand in his actions. During the trial, the state presented its own expert witnesses who testified that although Michael King had a low IQ, he was still able to understand the difference between right and wrong and fully comprehend the consequences of his actions. Another witness testified that Michael had been at a gun range just two hours prior to the kidnapping of Denise, and that he'd been in possession of the murder weapon. The state argued that Michael had been practicing for his heinous act at the range, and then went on a search for a victim. He drove around for a while before randomly deciding on Denise's home, after noticing that she was home alone. After abducting her, he took her back to his own home where he repeatedly assaulted her for hours, before going to his cousin's house to borrow the items he needed to bury her later. On August 28, 2009, after two and a half hours of deliberations, Michael King was found guilty of first-degree murder, involuntary sexual battery, and kidnapping. The jury recommended the death penalty. He tried to appeal his sentence in 2012, but it was ultimately rejected, and he remains on death row to this day. Denise's family went on to file a wrongful death lawsuit against the Charlotte County Police following the dispatcher's errors. This was settled out of court for $1.25 million, after Nathan paid nearly $500,000 in lawyer's fees, he put the rest of the money into a college fund for his kids and also purchased a modest home for the family.